hello, my name is Paul, and I'm the library director here at the Brockton Public Library. On behalf of the library staff, represented by SEIU 888, on behalf of the library trustees, Jocelyn Meek, chair, and on behalf of the library foundation, it is my sincere honor to welcome all of you to the Brockton Public Library tonight. Thank you. <laughs> yes, applause here. <laughs> Uh, at this time, it is my also equally great honor to um, introduce to you the Mayor of the City of Champions, Mayor Robert F. Sullivan. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. I just first of all want to welcome you to Brockton. I know there's a lot of people here tonight that drove to the City of Brockton. I thank you for being here. We welcome you with open arms. Uh, a week ago, we, uh, we kicked off this uh, event, and this is wonderful. I'm, a, I'm the son of a history teacher. My dad was a Brockton High history teacher for over 32 years. Uh, and history is, is what we learn from to better the future. And I just want to thank each and every one of you for taking the time to come here and to educate us. Um, I would also encourage you, please, visit the kiosks and the booths. Take the, the, the literature that's there. Um, there's going to be 42 of these uh, events. Uh, Pat Monteith, uh, was Pat, thank you, Pat, uh, thank you, Paul. 42 of these, uh, the kickoff was last week, and this is educational uh, for all of us and also for the next generation. I'm a, I'm a dad of three young kids, and to educate them and teach them is really what's beneficial. I do want to recognize my, uh, my colleague from the City Council, Councilor Jack Lally, for being here. Thank you for being here, Jack. And a former colleague on the city council, uh, former council, Ann Boragat, is here as well. Thank you, Ann. I look forward to uh, speaking uh, to you over the next year. And uh, again, thank you so much. Enjoy your evening, and welcome to Brockton. Thank you. Welcome everyone. Um, I want to introduce Freddie Kay. She's here from Suffrage 100. She's going to give um, some remarks. Um, welcome. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I'm asking Katrina Hufflemine to join me here. Uh, my name is Freddie Kay, and I'm the founder and president of Suffrage 100 Massachusetts. And Katrina Hufflemine is our vice president, and she's also town councilor from the town of Randolph. Um, yes. <laughs> we really appreciate and thank you for inviting us here this evening. This is our table in the back with some materials that we hope you'll stop by and pick up. We have these wonderful purple pens with our website on it, Suffrage 100 MA, which we encourage you to check out. And you'll see some people with buttons. We have Suffrage 100 Massachusetts buttons that we hope you'll pick up as well and um, check out our website. We're very happy to be here this evening. We are a nonprofit, nonpartisan, statewide coalition with now 125 partners as of this evening. Um, and looking for more, and we're looking forward to the Brockton uh, Library becoming one of our partners and many other organizations here in Brockton, which is wonderful. We've brought with us these panels in the back. These are display panels of a project we're working on with the Commonwealth Museum of Massachusetts, which many of you may know. It's located across from the JFK Library. And these are a suffragist panel of the month. Um, and we take these around. They are on our website. And copies of these are in the back. And you're welcome to take them home with you and uh, look up the others that we've had. We've been doing one a month, so we're well over 20 now, and we're continuing to do them. And this evening, we were very happy to be able to bring, appropriate for this event, um, people of color who were very instrumental in the suffrage movement. I'm going to stop there and turn it over to Katrina for other remarks about, about us. Thank you. Absolutely. As Freddie said, thank you so much. I mean, what a panel. I was so excited. Um, and I, but you know, and whether I was with the Suffrage 100 or just myself, I made a point to put this in my calendar because I definitely wanted to be here. I definitely wanted to be part of of, of this event. Uh, one thing, just and I know we only have a two-minute um, 
opportunity. Uh, one thing I want you to know about Suffrage 100 Mass is that not only are we celebrating the history of the 19th Amendment, but we're also very, um, we, we recognize some, uh, some of the women who had the right to vote, but we also recognize the women who at the time did not have the right to vote. So the 19th Amendment did not mean that all women had the right to vote at that time. So our focus is to understand and celebrate some history, but recognize also some of the issues around that time and some of the issues that continue to happen in today's society. So this is our mission, this is our focus. And so we, we just want to let you know that we are um, conscious of what needs to be worked out today and conscious of what needed to be worked out yesterday as well. So thank you so much. Because of them, I can now live the dream. I am the seed of the free and I know it. I intend to bear great fruit. Sojourner Truth. Welcome to the third part of the Black Women's Suffrage Series. It is, it is an honor to be moderating this event tonight with three wonderful women and to be able to share with you all information on a movement that brought great change in the United States. Tonight we will hear from Marita Rivero, Dr. Paula Austin, and Charlene Green and discuss the struggles and the triumphs of the movement, the women that led the movement, and some of the first to make history. A few house rules. I kindly ask that you silence your phones or put them on vibrate so that it's not disruptive to others. Um, <clears throat> and I will also ask that you hold all of your questions to the end. I will try my best to call on every single one of you. Um, I do hope that you enjoy this event and leave tonight knowing more information about the women's suffrage. I now turn the mic over to Ms. Sydney, who will introduce the panelists, and then we'll begin the panel. Good evening. Good evening. It's great to be here. Before I start, I would like to recognize that uh, Senator Mike Brady has joined us, as well as, <laughs> as well as well as uh, the president of the NAACP, Brockton Area Branch, Phyllis Ellis. I would also like to take a moment to thank all of you for being here. This is a wonderful crowd. I'm so pleased. And uh, to thank our major funders for this, this evening's event, Mass Humanities and the Barbara Lee Family Foundation. So first, I will start. Uh, Start our introductions. Dr. Paula Austin is a U.S. historian with a focus on American history, the history of race and racism, visual culture, urban and women's history, history of social science, and the history of childhood. She is particularly interested in interiority and in broadening the narrow definitions of intellectual history. Her forthcoming book, Coming of Age in Jim Crow DC, Navigating the Politics of Everyday Life, is a social and intellectual history of poor and working class young people, young black people, in early 20th century, racially segregated Washington, D.C. As an undergraduate, Dr. Austin was trained as a creative writer and developed her teaching pedagogy in adult basic education in classrooms in New York City. In 2016, she was the co-editor of Radical Teacher, volume 106, special issue on teaching hashtag Black Lives Matter, and is the author of Conscious Self-Realization and Self-Direction, New Negro Ideologies in the Confines of Visual Representation, in journal, in, I'm sorry, in the Journal of African American History. She has a forthcoming article in Gender, Women, and Families of Color, and was a contributing author of Colonize This, Young Women in, I'm sorry, Young Women of Color on Today's Feminism. It is Daisy Hernandez and Bushra Raymond. Dr. Austin was an inaugural archival fellow at NYPL's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and a Jackie McLean fellow at the University of Hartford. 
She has served as diversity faculty fellow for professional development at the Center for Teaching and Learning and with the Division of Inclusive, Inclusive Excellence at California State University, Sacramento. Welcome, Dr. Austin. Thank you. Next, we have Charlene Green. Miss, Miss Doctor? No, just Miss. Just Miss? Okay. I'm, I didn't write this. I want to make sure. Miss Green has always had a passion for, for teaching and for many years taught mathematics at the Cambridge Ringe and Latin School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now retired from that position, she continues to take advantage of opportunities to interact with young people as she believes in the pursuit of educational excellence and expanding their horizons. Most recently, she completed and implemented curriculum design and, pr and programming for a STEM program for youngsters in the Boston area. She also works as the coach mentor for the Accelerated College Experiences Program, or ACE. Ms. Green strongly believes in service to her community and serves on the trustee board at her church. Through her participation in the Boston and Brockton double and NAACP AXO programs, she has served students in various capacities, including coach mentor and chaperone and project judge. She is currently the president of the Greater Boston Section of the National Council of Negro Women. Ms. Green is the mother of two grown children and a grandmother of three. A lifelong Bostonian, she resides in the city with her husband of 34 years. Welcome. Thank you. And finally, Marita Rivera began in production at WGBH-TV in 1970 and moved into public broadcasting management positions in 1980, encompassing live, live events, electronic and digital media. Her life's work has been to capture our stories, often untold, and to help us find one another across our differences. Her noteworthy national television projects include Africans in America, A History of Slavery, and This Far by Faith, as well as digital channel World. Ms. Rivera launched the daily international radio news program, The World. She served as VP and GM for radio and television, WGBH Boston, and was vice president for radio at WPFW Pacifica, D.C., and the president and CEO of the Museum of, Nation Museum of African American History in Boston and N Nantucket. Ms. Rivera received the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce's Pinnacle Award, the MWPC Abigail Adams Tribute Award, the YWCA Women Achievers Award, among other noteworthy community and professional awards that include Peabody, Columbia DuPont, and Emmy Awards, Regional NABJ Journalist of the Year Award, the New England NATAS Silver Circle Induction. She served on the NPR board, the PRI board, and as board chair of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She joined the board of the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau in 2019, having served other local boards, including as board chair of Bunker Hill Community College, the Urban League, the YWCA DC in Boston, in Boston, Kokobidi Institute in Ghana. Nationally, she chaired Black Public Media and Radio's National Federation of Community Broadcasters. Her interview for History Makers was entered into the National Archives. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, Sydney. All righty, let's begin. Um, I believe in order to give the audience a true understanding of the movement, we should begin with the antebellum period. So Professor Austin, um, would you mind giving us an overview or a brief history of the antebellum period? I don't know that I was prepared, fully prepared to do that, but I will, I'll do my best. Okay. Um, so when I was, first I want to thank you for inviting me to be here. I, this is my first year in Boston at BU, and um, I'm fr originally from New York, but I'm, I'm coming via Sacramento, California. So it's been a very nice welcome that I've gotten since I've been here, so I just wanted to say thank you. 
Um, so the antebellum period, um, it sounds to me, Courtney, like maybe you're asking um, for a sort of expansion mm -hmm. when we're thinking about suffrage and mm -hmm. we're thinking about uh, commemorating this anniversary of the amendment, um, that maybe what you're looking for is a little bit of an expansion of the time frame that right. we're thinking about. Okay, yes, I, okay. brief. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think this is really, it's really right, because when we're thinking about uh, black women's engagement, I feel like this, I'm, this is what really you're going to talk about. But when we're thinking about, about black women's uh, engagement in the struggle for, um, for racial equality, essentially, uh, voting rights is an essential part of it. And I, I think if we're gonna start in the antebellum period, we're going to probably need to start with Mariah Stewart, who is, you know, Boston's own, um, and really stands out, kind of, probably stands kind of as um, a standard bearer for black women's activism in the antebellum period um, around uh, sort of multiple issues. So suffrage and voting rights and electoral mm -hmm power is an incredibly important part of what black women are looking for, but certainly in the antebellum period, anti-slavery is an essential part of the of the activism that's happening. And um, Mariah Stewart is sort of famous for, um, well, one, sort of stepping out of the prescribed uh, conventional roles that women generally were supposed to be in. Um, but secondly, she's sort of calling on um, uh, anti-slavery advocates. Uh, she's actually making one of the earliest speeches she makes in 1823, 32. One of those. Marita, you're going to tell me the real date, probably. Um, uh, but it's before. My point is that it's before Seneca Falls, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of you know when we think about the suffrage movement, we often like identify 1848 as the kind of beginning, and then the 19th Amendment in 1920 is kind of the end of suffrage of the suffrage movement. But if we if we include Mariah Stewart, then we're looking at uh, the 1820s essentially, and we're including things like uh, anti-slavery. Um, work as well as work of uh, women's kind of electoral um, power, even though women are not necessarily voting at the time. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll yes. leave it there. Yes, okay. that sounds great. Okay. <laughs> so um, you mentioned Maria Stewart, uh, one of my favorite um, suffragettes. Um, Marita, who are some of the other women along with Maria Stewart um, during that time period? Uh, we, we really like her because she lived like on Joy Street in Boston on Beacon Hill. So her home has a plaque on it mm -hmm. that a women's group in Boston gathered and, you know, put there. So we can visit her space. Um, uh, and I want to say, she wasn't she a, a play, praised for speaking before and what they call the, uh, I want to say an integrated audience, yeah, yeah, but it yeah. meant men and women in the same space. Right, right. Just unheard of. Uh, she did that at the African Meeting House, mm -hmm. too, in Boston. Mm -hmm. uh, and she famously said, um, uh, you know, women, come out of your kitchens. Mm -hmm. We have work to do. Uh, so she was the right, I think we pronounce it Mariah. I think mm -hmm. she called it Mariah Stewart. Um, there were other women in that period. Harriet uh, Bell Hayden. Um, her, Harriet's husband was so famous. They both came out of Kentucky, um, taught themselves to read and write. Um, became wonderful philanthropists outside Detroit. And on a trip, fundraising trip to Boston, the Boston crowd said, wait a minute, you're supposed to be here. This is, this is the epicenter of that last wave of abolition. So they, the, the Haydens moved to Boston, to Beacon Hill, that north slope of Beacon Hill, which was the black community. Um, and Harriet really became the person in that couple who managed Boston's Underground Railroad. The people who were coming uh, north might have to leave Boston and go on to New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, perhaps Canada. Um, it was quite an active uh, uh, underground movement, and it was Harriet uh, of that couple uh, who managed that. Her husband, Lewis, is one of my loves. He was just a fabulous kind of guy, but today we're talking about Harriet, uh, who entertained and who really managed a quite complex world. Uh, I wrote down a, a list of uh, other women, some I see on the posters in the back, I see them behind me in slides. Um, 
maybe what I want to say is that uh, they were like us. This whole phrase, cultural heritage, is, has become more and more important to me uh, as I've gotten older, because it says that the way we behave among one another, the relationships we have, uh, didn't just spring up today or in our generation. They, in fact, sprang up. If black people came here in the early 1500s, they started springing up in the early 1500s because they came from wherever we came from. Um, and so what you see as you look at history is the opportunity to reclaim relationships. You know, often we, we think they were doing something else and, and we forget they had real lives, real families, um, uh, often partners in, in marriages, children, they had friends, they had clubs, they had uh, they enjoyed music, they enjoyed uh, uh, all the kinds of things that we enjoy. They, they were in relationship with life. Um, and if we don't think that, they become stick figures, right? And we lose track of what they were doing, and truthfully, people don't see them at all. After a while, that's what happened to women. Just weren't seen. Women were standing around right, all the time, black people, people of color, standing around next to one another all through all this time, decades, centuries, and they just weren't seen because no one thought to see them. They weren't, they were just, they become invisible, not because of anything they did, but because of the way we were viewing them. So I, I like us to remember cultural heritage. Uh, I don't want to use it more, more time. I can throw some names at you, but uh, I think whoever, whatever names we're looking at, we have to think of them as three-dimensional, fully dimensional people uh, with full lives, and we need to press ourselves to understand what those lives were, um, because it's in that search that we find ourselves. We, 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 we seat ourselves. And I, I say that in closing, I'll say, because I'm sitting here surrounded by, this feels like my team in this room. My team's here. <laughs> they faced whatever they had to face, and they pulled it off. Uh, and I think that's the feeling we need to give our children, uh, and we need to give one another, that, that sense of uh, power. Thank you, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so we, we talked about Mariah Stewart, and um, we also talked about Harriet, but who were some of the other women? Like, um, I've heard of Phyllis Wheatley, and I've heard of Lucy Terry Price. So who, who, are, who are some of the other women? <laughs> okay. uh, I'll do Lucy Terry. Uh, Lucy Terry was a poet. Um, she's the first recorded poet. First published was Phyllis Wheatley, but first recorded was a Lucy. She was born in, in Africa. Uh, so you think she came here, no matter how young, I think she was five, she came here with a whole sense of what her culture was and who she was in it. Um, she was sold twice and wound up in Deerfield, Mrs., uh, Massachusetts with her family. Um, uh, and she obviously loved words. She, she became religious, you know, and she learned to read, write, and spoke powerfully. Um, and so she's known for a poem she wrote about an Indian raid uh, on Deerfield when you know, maybe five people were killed and one wounded. Uh, at the time, people sang a poem. They didn't just write the poem uh, in colonial times, and which was also a kind of African tradition. So people learned the poem just because that's, <laughs> they didn't have to read or write in order to, to know the poem. It wasn't recorded until after she died. Um, but by then, she'd also created a much larger space for herself. She fought off two attempts to steal her property, uh, which was not unusual among black people. Uh, one time, she was fighting the, the state's attorney general. An Argo Archival fellow at NYPL's Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and a Jackie McLean fellow at the University of Hartford. She has served as diversity faculty fellow for professional development at the Center for Teaching and Learning and with the Division of Inclusive, Inclusive Excellence at California State University, Sacramento. Welcome, Dr. Austin. Next, we have Charlene Green. Miss, Miss Doctor? Just Miss? Okay. <laughs> I didn't write this, I want to make sure. Ms. Green has always had a passion for, for teaching and for many years taught mathematics at the Cambridge Ringe and Latin School in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Now retired from that position, she continues to take advantage of opportunities to interact with young people as she believes in the pursuit of educational excellence and expanding their horizons. Most recently, she completed and implemented curriculum design, 
and, and programming for a STEM program for youngsters in the Boston area. She also works as a coach mentor for the Accelerated College Experiences Program, or ACE. Ms. Green strongly believes in service to her community and serves on the trustee board at her church. Through her participation in the Boston and Brockton double and NAACP AXO programs, she has served students in various capacities, including coach, mentor, and chaperone and project judge. She is currently the president of the Greater Boston Section of the National Council of Negro Women. Ms. Green is the mother of two grown children and a grandmother of three. A lifelong Bostonian, she resides in the city with her husband of 34 years. Welcome. Thank you. And finally, Marita Rivera began in production at WGBH-TV in 1970 and moved into public broadcasting management positions in 1980, encompassing live, live events, electronic and digital media. Her life's work has been to capture our stories, often untold, and to help us find one another across our differences. Her noteworthy national television projects include Africans in America, A History of Slavery, and This Far by Faith, as well as Digital Channel World. Ms. Rivera launched the daily international radio news program, The World. She served as VP and GM for radio and television, WGBH Boston, and was vice president for radio at WPFW Pacifica DC and the president and CEO of the Museum of, Nation Museum of African American History in Boston and Nantucket. Ms. Rivera received the Greater Boston Chamber of Commerce's Pinnacle Award, the MWPC Abigail Adams Tribute Award, the YWCA Women Achievers Award, among other noteworthy community and professional awards that include Peabody, Columbia DuPont, and Emmy Awards, Regional NABJ Journalist of the Year Award, the New England NATAS Silver Circle Induction. She served on the NPR Board, the PRI Board, and as Board Chair of the National Trust for Historic Preservation. She joined the Board of the Greater Boston Convention and Visitors Bureau in 2019, having served other local boards, including as Board Chair of Bunker Hill Community College, the Urban League, the YWCA DC in Boston, in Boston, Cocoa Beatty Institute in Ghana. Nationally, she chaired Black Public Media and Radio's National Federation of Community Broadcasters. Her interview for History Makers was entered into the National Archives. Welcome and thank you. Thank you, Sydney. All righty, let's begin. Um, I believe in order to give the audience a true understanding of the movement, we should begin with the antebellum period. So Professor Austin, um, would you mind giving us an overview or a brief history of the antebellum period? I don't know that I was prepared, fully prepared to do that, but I will, I'll do my best. Okay. Um, so when I was, first I want to thank you for inviting me to be here. I, this is my first year in Boston at BU, and um, I'm fr originally from New York, but I'm, I'm coming via Sacramento, California. So it's been a very nice welcome that I've gotten since I've been here, so I just wanted to say thank you. Um, so the antebellum period, um, it sounds to me, Courtney, like maybe you're asking um, for a sort of expansion mm -hmm. when we're thinking about suffrage mm -hmm. and we're thinking about uh, commemorating this anniversary of the amendment, um, that maybe what you're looking for is a little bit of an expansion of the time frame that right. we're thinking about. Okay. Yes. I, okay. Brief. <laughs> okay. Um, and I think this is really, it's really right, because when we're thinking about uh, black women's engagement, I feel like this, I'm, this is what really you're going to talk about. But when we're thinking about, about black women's uh, engagement in the struggle for, um, for racial equality, essentially, uh, voting rights is an essential part of it. And I, I think if we're gonna start in the antebellum period, we're going to probably need to start with Mariah Stewart, who is, you know, Boston's own. Um, 
and really stands out, kind of probably stands kind of as um, a standard bearer for black women's activism in the antebellum period um, around uh, sort of multiple issues. So suffrage and voting rights and electoral mm -hmm power is an incredibly important part of what black women are looking for, but certainly in the antebellum period, anti-slavery is an essential part of the, of the activism that's happening. And um, Mariah Stewart is sort of famous for, um, well, one, sort of stepping out of the prescribed uh, conventional roles that women generally were supposed to be in. Um, but secondly, she's sort of calling on um, uh, anti-slavery advocates. Uh, she's actually making one of the earliest speeches she makes in 1823, 32, one of those. Marita, you're going to tell me the real date, probably. <laughs> um, uh, but it's before, my point is that it's before Seneca Falls, mm -hmm. uh, which is kind of, you know, when we think about the suffrage movement, we often like identify 1848 as the kind of beginning, and then the 19th Amendment in 1920 is kind of the end of suffrage, of the suffrage movement. But if we, if we include Mariah Stewart, then we're looking at uh, the 1820s, essentially, and we're including things like uh, anti-slavery, um, work as well as work of uh, women's kind of electoral um, power, even though women are not necessarily voting at the time. Mm -hmm. So I'll, I'll yes. leave it there. Yes, okay. that sounds great. Okay. <laughs> so um, you mentioned Maria Stewart, uh, one of my favorite um, suffragettes. Um, Marita, who are some of the other women along with Maria Stewart um, during that time period? Uh, we really like her because she lived up on Joy Street in Boston on Beacon Hill. So her home has a plaque on it mm -hmm. that a women's group in Boston gathered and, you know, put there. So we can visit her space. Um, uh, and I want to say, she wasn't she a, a play praised for speaking before and what they call the, uh, I want to say an integrated audience, yeah, yeah, but it yeah. meant men and women in the same space. Right, right. <laughs> unheard of. Uh, she did that at the African Meeting House, too, in Boston. Uh, and she famously said, um, uh, you know, women, come out of your kitchens. We have work to do. Uh, so she was the right, I think we pronounced it Mariah. I think mm -hmm. she called it Mariah Stewart. Um, there were other women in that period. Harriet uh, Bell Hayden. Um, her, Harriet's husband was so famous. They both came out of Kentucky, um, taught themselves to read and write. Um, became wonderful philanthropists outside Detroit. And on a trip, fundraising trip to Boston, the Boston crowd said, wait a minute, you're supposed to be here. This is, this is the epicenter of that last wave of abolition. So they, the, the Haydens moved to Boston, to Beacon Hill, that north slope of Beacon Hill, which was the black community. Um, and Harriet really became the person in that couple who managed Boston's Underground Railroad. The people who were coming uh, north might have to leave Boston and go on to New Hampshire, Vermont, Maine, perhaps Canada. Um, it was quite an active uh, uh, underground movement, and it was Harriet uh, of that couple uh, who managed that. Her husband, Lewis, is one of my loves. He was just a fabulous kind of guy, but today we're talking about Harriet, uh, who entertained and who really managed a quite complex world. Uh, I wrote down a, a list of uh, other women, some I see on the posters in the back, I see them behind me in slides. Um, maybe what I want to say is that uh, they were like us. This whole phrase, cultural heritage, is, has become more and more important to me uh, as I've gotten older, because it says that the way we behave among one another, the relationships we have, uh, didn't just spring up today or in our generation. They, in fact, sprang up if black people came here in the early 1500s, they started springing up in the early 1500s because they came from wherever we came from. Um, and so what you see as you look at history is the opportunity to reclaim relationships. You know, often we, we think they were doing something else, and, and we forget they had real lives, real families, um, uh, often partners in, in marriages, children. They had friends. They had clubs. They had... Uh, they enjoyed music, they enjoyed uh, uh, all the kinds of things that we enjoy. They, they were in relationship with life. Um, 
And if we don't think that, they become stick figures, right? And we lose track of what they were doing, and truthfully, people don't see them at all. After a while, that's what happened to women. Just weren't seen. Women were standing around right all the time, black people, people of color, standing around next to one another all through all this time, decades, centuries, and they just weren't seen because no one thought to see them. They weren't, they were just, they become invisible, not because of anything they did, but because of the way we were viewing them. So I, I like us to remember cultural heritage. Uh, I don't want to use it more, more time. I can throw some names at you, but uh, I think whoever, whatever names we're looking at, we have to think of them as three dimension, fully dimensional people uh, with full lives, and we need to press ourselves to understand what those lives were, um, because it's in that search that we find ourselves. We, 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 we seat ourselves. And I, I say that in closing, I'll say, because I'm sitting here surrounded by, this feels like my team in this room. My team's here. <laughs> they faced whatever they had to face, and they pulled it off. Uh, and I think that's the feeling we need to give our children, uh, and we need to give one another, that, that sense of uh, power. Thank you, wonderful, wonderful. Um, so we, we talked about Mariah Stewart, and um, we also talked about Harriet, but who were some of the other women? Like, um, I've heard of Phyllis Wheatley, and I've heard of Lucy Terry Price. So who, who, are, who are some of the other women? <laughs> uh, I'll do Lucy Terry. Uh, Lucy Terry was a poet. Um, she's the first recorded poet. First published was Phyllis Wheatley, but first recorded was a Lucy. She was born in, in Africa. Uh, so you think she came here, no matter how young, I think she was five, she came here with a whole sense of what her culture was and who she was in it. Um, she was sold twice and wound up in Deerfield, Missis, uh, Massachusetts with her family. Um, uh, and she obviously loved words. She, she became religious, you know, and she learned to read, write, and spoke powerfully. Um, and so she's known for a poem she wrote about an Indian raid uh, on Deerfield when you know, maybe five people were killed and one wounded. Uh, at the time, people sang a poem. They didn't just write the poem uh, in colonial times, and which was also a kind of African tradition. So people learned the poem just because that's, <laughs> they didn't have to read or write in order to, to know the poem. It wasn't recorded until after she died. Um, but by then, she'd also created a much larger space for herself. She fought off two attempts to steal her property, uh, which was not unusual among black people. Uh, one time, she was fighting the, the state's attorney general. She just out-talked him. <laughs> she had a son she tried to get into Williams College, her son who fought in the Revolutionary War, tried to get him into the Williams College. Uh, uh, in her, um, so, the, so these fights to um, secure her land also made her a public figure. Um, when she died, she had a huge obit right up in the Vermont Gazette, which was unheard of for a woman, a black woman, a black man. Uh, she was a really, um, lived a very long life, known, uh, well-loved person, but part of the well-loved was her activism, was her agency. She just wasn't gonna stand by and let somebody try to take her land. Um, so that, does that, that's a good person for you. And um, you asked me to say a bit about um, Mumbat, maybe? Yes. Um, Elizabeth Freeman. Mm -hmm. um, again, uh, this is someone who, you know, who just, you know, at some point just, you know, I'm bad as hell, I'm not going to take it, that kind of thing. She was, she was inadvertently struck um, by, um, an owner who was trying to hit her sister, I think, hit her instead. And she was so outraged, she just left. She walked away from the house. And in this period, as you say, the people have been hearing about revolution and freedom. Uh, and she thought, what about me? She couldn't read or write, but she thought, what about me? That's just the language you can imagine everybody was talking about. If you were in that situation, you'd wake up every morning asking yourself, how do I get out of this? Uh, so she said, why not me? And um, found a lawyer, sued the family. She won. <laughs> you know, they had to pay her. Uh, she worked as a free woman for the attorney who freed her, but for the attorney for some years for that family. Um, but she went on with that sort of activism, uh, political activism. 
and people really feel she laid the she laid the um, groundwork, the bed for Massachusetts, the state's work to abolish slavery in 1780. So it was it was through people like Mum Bet uh, and others, men and women, um, who just said this is not true and and decided to fight this through the court, through the Massachusetts court, some through petitions, uh, some through just literally, literally court cases. Um, their point was, I'm a person, I'm a human being, uh, and I deserve to be treated uh, as one by all the rules uh, governing anybody else in this space. Uh, and their arguments were so pervasive and so su successful over time um, that in fact Massachusetts then became, as it had been the first state to embrace slavery, it now became <laughs> the first state to abolish it. So that, that's, uh, and you had asked about Harriet Tubman and Phyllis Wheatley, and I want to just say this about Phyllis, and then I'll stop. <laughs> okay. uh, she asked me to do three people. Phyllis, um, Phyllis Wheatley, we know, was a published poet. Um, again, she was just smart. She learned to read and write, and uh, she'd been born in Africa. I want to say something about the book that she, that, that really established her as a, a force. Um, what, did, what did she talk about? She talked about, she talked about, let me see if I can, she really, she talked about the um, poems on various subjects. She challenged the major justification for enslavement of Africans, the European assumption of African inferiority. That's what Phyllis Wheatley was talking about. So we're not just talking about a poem. Uh, and that, that uh, justification of enslavement, the assumption of African inferiority, uh, is, a, is a theme that I'll, I'd like to come back to later on the panel. Because that has underwritten everything. You're going to come right up to today. That has underwritten everything that we have suffered, the presumption that we're not dealing with whole human beings who have good judgment, values, compassion, you know, pain, a families, uh, love, they just don't have any of that. They're some kind of second tier sort of people. And therefore, we're, it's all right if we uh, allow our healthcare systems to treat them poorly, or we allow our schools to function badly, or et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that, that assumption of inferiority is something we need to tackle as a society. And that is what all of these women did. Thank you, Marita. So I want to shift a little bit to um, after the civil rights movement um, and going into the early um, the early twentieth century. Um, Professor Austin, can you can you give us an overview of that time? What was the political and social climate during the early twentieth century? So um, so after the the Civil War yeah. and the and the the abolition of slavery. Okay. So I mean the. Martha Jones, who's a, a legal historian, um, talks about, what does she call, I actually made a note about this because I was listening to a um, talk that she did recently. Um, and she, she sort of calls on us to think about the relationship between the 15th Amendment um, and the 19th Amendment as these sort of, um, these amendments that have kind of a, a co-relationship with each other, um, and to also think about the language in both of those amendments as not denying um, rights to vote based on sort of any number of, of identities. Because um, she always kind of cautions us to, um, to, to, to be thoughtful about the language of granting mm -hmm. uh, rights, uh, and kind of to think about what those two amendments really did. But the thing about the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment is that they really set a precedent, right? They're the first amendments in the Constitution that have that section that says, and Congress shall have the power to enforce, right? They're, that is the first time in the Constitution for any of the amendments that, that, that the federal government really gets kind of, you know, gets some muscles. Um, and, and people, African Americans, newly freed African Americans, but even uh, black people who had been free in, in the US for generations, really were like, yeah, well, we're going to ask you to use your muscle, right? You've given yourself some muscle in these amendments, and we're going like, to have you put the, the muscles to the test. Um, and some of what happens in that period after those amendments is that 
we see, and this is this is the other thing about kind of expanding out the suffrage time frame to be inclusive of other kinds of activism that was um, sort of about a full set of rights. Uh, and so some of the organizations that I think about that form in that period, in the Reconstruction and the post-Reconstruction period, are women's organizations. So I'm talking about before club women yes. are really forming um, you know, the National Association of Colored Women, before we get the Niagara Movement and the NAACP. Women are forming organizations that are primarily around economic justice issues. So I'm thinking about uh, two kind of proto-unions that are formed in New Orleans and Atlanta in the 1870s, 1880s, uh, 1890s that are, that are fighting to get fair wages. Most of them are domestic workers. They're laundresses, and they're fighting for fair wages. Um, and they're using all kinds of tactics, right? So sometimes, you know, they're doing petition writing, they're boycotting laundries, they're striking, but they're also using intimidation for people who cross the picket line. I mean, there's one story, it's a great story that's told in Tara Hunter's book, um, To Joy My Freedom, of um, a uh, black woman who tries to get into the laundry because she's picking up a check. Like, she's not actually crossing the picket line. And they, like, snatch her back from the door and sort of, you know, physically prevent her from getting in there. Um, they later find out she was just trying to get her, like, money. And they're like, OK. But they had, like, ripped her clothes off. I mean, it was just, like, intimidation, a little bit of violence. Um, to sort of uh, to, to access not just fair wages, but also to, to have a shift in working conditions. So they make real demands, um, but not just demands around their economic justice, but they're demanding more black police. In New Orleans, for example, they are um, they're supporting railroad strike, right? They're supporting other strikes that are happening. So there's an economic justice campaign that's happening in the Reconstruction and post-Reconstruction period that is inclusive of of all kinds of rights, um, not just electoral. But the electoral piece is a really interesting one, given that black men ha could, well, in some places, right, the, theoretically had the right to vote, right? But one of the things that many um, women organized were these sort of gun, protective gun clubs that actually escorted their husbands, their sons, um, to the polls to cast their vote because there was already limitations being put on black men from voting. Um, and women provided that uh, kind of escort um, bodyguards to get their family members to the polls to cast votes in, in many southern uh, locales. Wow, I did not know that. <laughs> I learned something new. Um, I know you mentioned some of the obstacles that, um, that these women faced, but what are some of the obstacles that African-American women faced that not necessarily the, um, the white women faced during that period? Well, I mean, so there are a couple of things. One of the things is, um, is sexual violence and, and sexual harassment, uh, and the kind, especially for domestic workers at the time. I mean, one of the things that is beginning to shift is that uh, in the post-slavery period, in the Reconstruction period, more and more black women are saying, I'm actually not going to work, live in the home. Um, I'm going to, like, I will come in and, and do domestic service. I'll come in and be a maid. I'll come in to do child care. I'll come in to do, to pick up the laundry and take it home. But more and more black women are saying, I'm not going to live in the house. And, um, and you know, black parents are saying, my, my young a daughter is not going to come and stay. She's, she, she can come and clean for you, but she's not going to stay in the house. And that is primarily because of um, pervasive sexual harassment and sexual violence that really black women had been experiencing um, since uh, the institution of slavery and then, and then certainly beyond. Uh, and of course, the, the anti-lynching campaign right, that Ida B. Wells is, is um, is the head of, uh, and of course there's a, I, have my, I picked up my Wells uh, button, um, you know, speaks to sort of the, and she of course articulates very clearly the distinction between sort of how white womanhood is being thought about and protected in particular ways and black womanhood is, is not. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, so there, so there is that, and of course Ida B. Wells starts the kind of first official 
um, suffrage, uh, women's suffrage organization in Chicago. I think it's the only, like, official, one that's exclusively uh, black women doing voting rights. I think so. So is that what led the separation? What led the separation between the, the, the white suffragettes and the black suffragettes? Because I know a lot of the black women had to march in the back during yes. the march. So yeah. what, what led the divide? So, and I also want to, I want to just, you know, the, so I am not a suffrage scholar, right. but if there are any in the room, um, you might be saying, don't tell her she can't say suffragettes. Okay. Um, so, you know, I, and because suffragettes and suffragists, mm -hmm. right, were very, very different. different. Um, and actually the U.S. Uh, sort of suffrage movement most identified as suffragists, and partly because suffragettes, uh, who were who were the, who the British, um, uh, suffrage uh, activists identified themselves as were, were militant in particular ways that U.S. Um, mostly uh, white middle class women did not want to identify with um, uh, because, because they were really interested in kind of uh, presenting themselves in particular ways at, at that time. But you asked about the what, what, ha what how does the breakup happen, yes. right? Because black women and white women are working together uh, in the abolition movement, right? And, and Douglas is, uh, um, is part of this movement. But the 15th Amendment is part of what causes this break. And I don't know, Marina, were you gonna talk about Lucy Stone at all? No. Okay. <laughs> but, um, but she's, you know, a local, she is a local um, white woman activist who actually uh, breaks with Elizabeth Cady Stanton and, and Susan B. Anthony who are saying, um, who essentially are are upset about the Fifteenth Amendment and really and begin to kind of mobilize, you know, what we would would hear as as really racist um, sort of and I think classist uh, and maybe even xenophobic kind of uh, language and and ideas about um, black men getting the vote before white women and specifically white upper and middle class women are getting the vote and. Um, Lucy Stone really breaks and actually forms a different organization. Uh, but this is that this is how that coalition, that interracial, interclass coalition, really breaks apart at the end of the of the nineteenth century. Um, uh, it's specifically around the disagreement around the Fifteenth Amendment. Thank you, Professor Austin. So Charlene, you're part of the National Council of Negro Women, so you do see the importance of organization. Um, what were some of the clubs in the club, the women club era? The, and what was their role? Um, Marie, Marita and Dr. Austin have um, mm -hmm. said a lot of the things yeah. that I would have, <laughs> would have said, particularly in your, the information around the 15th Amendment. Um, it definitely caused a rift within the, the various organizations. And as a result, um, the, uh, one of the major organizations at that time that was interracial was the American Equal Rights uh, Association. Uh, the 15th Amendment, um, which gave men the right to vote, excuse me, black men the right to vote, or you know, it's just said that everyone had the right to vote, all men, uh, caused a division within that organization and um, therefore out of that came the American Women's Suffrage uh, Association. But there were a lot of, a lot of uh, clubs and groups formed specifically by black women, including, um, you mentioned the Alpha Suffrage Club, which was formed in Chicago in 1913 by Ida B. Wells. Um, and the objectives for that particular organization were, were to, um, inform black women of their civic responsibility to help them organize around um, and, and help uh, black candidates get elected to political office. And also they were very um, instrumental in the suffrage movement um, to, to, to move it forward. They um, included women, they gave a voice to African-American women and included uh, with, excuse me, African-American women who had been excluded from the um, National American Women's Suffrage Association, which was the organization by Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony. So that, there was that organization. There were other organizations, including the Colored Women's Associ Progressive 
Association, and that one was in, actually came out in 1880. I should have probably mentioned that one first. And that organization was organized by Mary Ann Shad Carey, and they had 40 people, both male and female, at their first meeting in Washington, D.C. And they were, again, advocated equal rights for all. They emphasized work parity and financial autonomy as well as suffrage, and they just wanted to advance the rights of, of, of women, and in particular black women, um, in, this, in their society. Um, Ida B. Wells, getting back to the Alpha Suffrage Club, she, um, in addition to her anti-lynching um, stance and, and, and struggle, um, she was asked, the Alpha group was asked to, to, um, to march in a parade um, that the uh, National Women's Party was giving in 1913. But they were asked to march at the back of the parade, this particular black women's organization. And Ida B. Wells said, mm, no, I don't think so. <laughs> so she, um, she did a, a Rosie Ruiz. I don't know if you remember Rosie Ruiz but, <laughs> from the Boston Marathon. But she did a Rosie Ruiz. She came in, she, she, you know, as the white women suffragists were, were uh, marching past uh, she, Ida B. Wells Barnett, came right out of the crowd and just joined in with the white women, as opposed to being at the back of the parade with the, you know, with the rest of the women from the Alpha Suffrage Club. So, she was very um, progressive and, 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 and courageous in that um, regard. But um, the, the, you know, the black women suffragists, they they formed associations, they held conventions, they gave speeches, they, they joined in interracial efforts to secure the ballot for, for everyone, and they, um, they marched, they, they self-advocated, they canvassed, they organized, they did whatever they could to further the cause of the uh, suffrage, suffrage movement. Thank you. Can I, yeah, I just want to add one thing. I think the thing that's really important about thinking about the club women and thinking about like the National Baptist um, Convention Women's Auxiliary Group is that Black women were part of were parts of organizations, these like multi pronged, multi issue organizations that were so much more focused focused on a kind of broad spectrum of human rights um, than just specifically suffrage. And I think sometimes when they're missing from like the suffrage history books, you're like, oh, well, maybe they didn't care about voting. But it's really that they were part of these organizations that were interested in like so, so many different things um, that were inclusive of, or, of electoral power, but not exclusive to mm -hmm. electoral power. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So that concludes my questions. Um, I'm going to open it up to the audience. We do have a mic. Um, where's Pat? Maybe she can hand it out. Um, I will ask to limit one question per person just for the sake of time. question is, um, I think the um, young lady that spoke before your, your panel was convened, she said that there were some black women that did not have the vote and some that did have the vote. And so I was just wondering about the impact of Jim Crow in the South on women once they did gain the vote in 1920. Um, you know, perhaps how they were not allowed to vote. I was just kind of curious about that after hearing um, what she had said in the beginning. I hadn't really thought about it, because you think about, oh, they got the vote, everybody got the vote. Mm -hmm. But was that necessarily true? Mm -hmm. Can I answer that? Start. Um, first of all, in 1910, before the uh, 19th Amendment was uh, ratified, women had the right to vote in Chicago. In Illinois, women had the right to vote. Right to vote, even in 1910. Um, once the 19th Amendment was ratified, of course, giving everyone tech, uh, theoretically the right to vote, black women and black people actually were still um, disenfranchised. And people like Mary McLeod Bethune were very uh, instrumental in trying to um, help black people get to the polls 
have the opportunity to vote and what have you. Mary McLeod Bethune, in fact, um, would ride around on her bicycle from door to door raising funds to help pay what was called the poll tax. The poll tax was what was established on, um, levied on people of color to prevent them from voting. You know, if you didn't have um, the funds you, you, to pay your poll tax, you were not allowed to vote. So Mary McLeod Bethune would ride around to um, help raise funds for that. She also um, knew that um, the um, establishment uh, had placed a literacy test uh, for black people in order to vote. You had to pass a literacy test. A lot of folks in that time were unable to read. So, and, and that includes the people giving the literacy test often <laughs> did not also know how to read. read. Yes. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, um, you know, Mary McLeod Bethune started, um, would give um, lessons in the evening, you know, teaching people how to read so that they were able to, uh, so that they would be able to pass the literacy tests mm -hmm. in order so you know, in order to have an opportunity to vote. Excuse me? She was in, in, both. in both Florida and um, uh, D.C. Um, she, as you know, is the founder of uh, Bethune-Cookman College, which started with seven young women, seven girls. She started this school, and it uh, is now Bethune-Cookman University down in uh, Daytona, Florida. I, I would just say I, I can remember how active, politically active my grandparents were in Richmond, Virginia. Um, <clears throat> And I remember the big fight when my grandmother broke and uh, you know didn't follow the party of Lincoln. I don't know who was running for president then. She <laughs> said she was going to vote for a Democrat. My grandfather couldn't believe that she was leaving the party of Lincoln. Um, and, the, and then we say, but of course they really couldn't vote. They couldn't vote. Black people could not vote. So they were engaged in the time. They were arguing the issues. They had candidates they backed. Um, they were doing everything they could to rally their community and to have influence, but they could not vote. And the, my grandfather was a doctor, so this was like, this wasn't about read and write, this was about, you, no, you're not going to participate. So I think that, that's the critical piece. And that's why the extension of the time frame is so important, right, for us to go back further than Seneca Falls and then to come forward really to 1965 and the Voting Rights Act. Um, and and there are people like um, Zephyr Wright who worked for LBJ before he becomes the president. She then works in, she's a, she's a black woman and she then works in the White House and is, he sort of credits her as, uh, as helping him to think about the Voting Rights Act in addition to, you know, King who kind of gets all of that, mm -hmm. the credit for that. Um, but uh, she shares her experience as um, as someone who's being kept from the polls and and other things, right? I mean, racial segregation is 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 everywhere mm -hmm. in all facets of life at that at that time. So extending the time period and really extending the time period to you know we could come to Stacey Abrams and yeah. voter, and all of her voter suppression work, right, to talk about mm -hmm. um, the continuation of keeping certain people from the polls. I mean, indigenous women also can't vote unless they give up their, their land rights. Uh, so we have a, a, a bunch of people who are actually not able to cast a ballot after 1920. There was also, um, I, I just didn't, did not mention the, the violence mm -hmm. that people experienced yeah. at that time, you know. Um, uh, so people were, were threatened, their homes were burned down, you know, a lot of uh, violent acts were committed during that time just to prevent people from voting. And like, as you were saying, um, it, right now in Georgia, people are being deliberately purged from the voting rolls for no apparent reason, or their votes are, or if they apply to uh, or register to votes, their registration is not processed until after the election you know, things of that nature. So there's still a lot of um, disenfranchisement going on even in 2020, which is, um, yeah, it's, it's, a lot. it's, I mean, it's the, amazing. The Mass Historical Society just completed a four-part uh, panel series on race, and um, which was uh, really terrific. But in, uh, in one of those panels, they really talked about protest and the uh, determination, determinant, 
for white supremacy having to do with blacks was that there was absolutely no way you could protest, whether you were picketing, boycotting, marching, uh, putting your knee down at a football game. It was no acceptable form of protest. Uh, and I think the you have to factor in the, the violence and the determination of the society to prevent women from, prevent any black person, but, but certainly women, from uh, being active uh, participants. So, so the, the stories, these stories that we are surrounded with today are, are truly incredible um, when you imagine the, the, the uh, environment they were being played out in. Thank you so much. This has uh, been so informative. I'm, I'm wondering if, um, uh, I believe, Ms. Rivera, you mentioned the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment and how, oh, that was Dr. Austin, <laughs> and how that created this expansion uh, for advocacy for individual rights. Could you say a little more about the period after 1920 when white women got the right to vote, but there were all these women's clubs that still had, black women that still had to organize uh, to get to 1965, but yet when the story is told of the Voting Rights Act, it's Dr. King and all of the men who led the movement. So could you say something uh, about the, the black women who were still had to organize and the absence of white women who had gotten the vote uh, to vote in that intervening 45 year period? Right, well you talked a little bit about right the, that important work and, and there are more and more um, scholars, sociologists, historians who are doing some of the work to sort of uncover and then put forth the role of women and really, you know, sort of working class, poor and working class women in communities who are doing a lot of that, you know, starting the freedom schools, running the freedom schools where, where they're teaching people how to read and to like prep, essentially prep for those literacy uh, tests. Um, you know, Fannie Lou Hayburn tells this amazing story, right, of when she sort of comes to consciousness around her ability to participate in, um, uh, in electoral politics uh, sort of in terms of her own registering, but also then, you know, she's, she's speaking at the Mississippi Democratic Freedom. Uh, but, you know, like, so she talks about this, this awakening that she really has and, um, you know, and risks her, li her work, her life, uh, really to, to lead this fight. And it's women like Fannie Lou Hamer um, who are doing the grassroots organizing that make the, what we know as the civil rights movement to, uh, as successful as it is, right? King can't get people out in those numbers if Fannie Lou Hamer and those other women are not like knocking on doors and getting people to sign up. And because politicization is you don't wake up and you're like, oh, I'm black, so I should participate in this movement. Like politicization is a process. And so they had to knock on people's doors and say, you know, here's something that you could do. Do you want to be part of this? And people you know, had to decide if they were willing to take those kinds of risks, some of them very serious risks, to participate. But that politicization process was a process that so many women, you know, in their local communities were really making that happen so that when King called for people to show up someplace, there were people who showed up someplace because they already had that social network that they had built at the local level. And those were being built by people like Fannie Lou Hamer. I'd also like to add that um the National Council of Negro Women formed, formed in 1935, again, by Mary McLeod Bethune. She's my hero. <laughs> um, but it was run for six decades by Dr. Dorothy Height. Amazing. And Dorothy Height was on the stage with uh, Dr. Martin Luther King during 1963 March on Washington. And she helped to get a lot of people there and mobilize a lot of women to participate in that, um, that, that, that march. And, and that I just wanted to say that. I just want to add a couple things. One is this, with the story of Fannie Lou Hamer, I think, is, is that, that enormous physical personal risk that she was beaten and jailed. And so for her to be able to get other people to join her when they could see what was happening, it was so dangerous for them. And so their bravery and their courage to say, despite all that, we are going to still keep doing this, I think, is just unbelievable and, and amazing. Yeah. The only other thing I just wanted to add is that we have some of the panels back here about some of the Boston women who I don't 
think that we talked about tonight, but Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin yeah. uh, from Boston, who was, I believe, one of the women who started NAACP in the Boston area, and Mariah Baldwin, who was a teacher. They were friends, they were suffragists together, and uh, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin worked on one of the women's groups and starting it here, which was great. So this enormous history in Boston, which is so terrific, and Massachusetts. So we were pleased when Marita joined us and um, Katrina f to honor the Massachusetts suffragists, African-American suffragists of Massachusetts this past August 26, which is where some of these panels come from. Thank you. I think um, in terms of women's groups, one of the things Delta Sigma Theta sorority mm -hmm. Um, in 1913 um, was formed and when they got to the um, march yeah. they did not tell them because they were black go to the back they said alphabetical and so Delta was in the front of the women's march but I wanted to, you to know that Delta Sigma Theta is a worldwide organization and those women which I am a part of, and and CNW, the their. Um, we have no. I'm sorry. We have another Delta behind you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, <laughs> we um. <laughs> and S G Row. Um, I'm talking about the, the Delta Sigma Theta that yes. was in the yes. the march. The march yeah. um, one of the things Very that the true. the sorority yeah. is about is public service. Mm -hmm. And they're about organizing with women. And they, they don't always do it in a loud manner. They do it in a quiet manner. And that's the thing about the women and the women's groups in Massachusetts. A lot of what's done is quiet. And a lot of what has happened is that our history isn't written. And what we need to do, the people in this room, is to get all of this history and, and successfully do what Marita has done. If you don't watch WGBH Channel 2 and see the documentaries and see some of the things that Marita is responsible for in creating and documenting our history and then say, what else can we document? There was one show on WGBH last week where a woman in 1941 said her pastor picked her up every day and took her to enroll for voting. One of the things that she had to do was tell them how many jelly beans were in a jar. Mm -hmm. Another thing they, he asked her was something, read something. And finally he asked her to do the preamble to the Constitution. And she knew the preamble to Constitution. And he said, I'm just tired of you black people. And he let her vote. Now, we need to understand that right now, Dr. Barber is in South Carolina because people are being taken away from the vote. People are being beaten because they want to vote in, nine, in this 2020. So that's what was going on then, but that is what is going on now. So if we're, as we're doing this, we need to understand that we are still in the new Jim Crow. Mm -hmm. We've never, Jim Crow has never stopped. And we need to understand it. Even though we had a black president, the reactionary behavior because of that is intense and real. Mm -hmm. And so whatever organizations there are, like NCNW or Delta Sigma Theta, or AKA, <laughs> you know, we need to support these organizations. We need to go to their events. Um, NCNW is doing a thing this weekend on voting rights and the census to get our community to understand what is going on. The work has not stopped. Thank you, thank you. That was that was great, and I'm, I'm trying to get my thoughts together. Um, hey. <laughs> so, you know, um, I appreciate you saying you talking about these women are 
regular women, families, children, trying to make it home to cook dinner, right? And still finding time to do this activist work. And, and so I, I, it made me think about today and, and you know, and I don't know, sometimes I talk to, because I, I teach as well, I talk to the students and say, what are you willing to do? You know, how far are you willing to go? Uh, are you willing to put your family on the front line? Because that's what many have done and had to, and as you mentioned, violently, sexually harassed, knowing that that might be an option, but Phil felt as if they didn't have a choice if they were going to fight for social justice. And so, so I want to know from you, what are some of the trends? Because me, I, um, as Freddie Cade mentioned, um, I'm a town councilor in, in Randolph, and it's tiring, and it's and you're fighting, and sometimes I told so actually I told Yana, I said. Yana Presley, I said, I'm tired. I just want to leave the table sometimes. And she said, no, sis, <laughs> you're not going anywhere. And I said, I know, I know, I'm just venting. Um, and so what are some of the trends that happened during that time that we could use today to help us mobilize uh, regain our energy and continue to go forward and share because we still, people still are not voting. The census 20, uh, 20 is very important. We still have individuals who are afraid to even put their information down on paper. Um, and I just think it's because we're not educated and knowing how much the census actually affect our communities and education and all the money that's in our communities. But what is some that you can share with me about today? I'll, I'll, I'll respond to this because we're sitting here with real historians and um, so the three of us would have to say history is important. <laughs> you, if you don't know where you come from, all the, you know, if you don't understand history, you have a hard time thinking about who you are. Um, and these stories, they've made a career out of this kind of storytelling and um, I've been drawn to it. Uh, we have to we have to tell each other our stories, um, and we have to find out about the stories that went before us because they validate us and they give you strength and confidence. Uh, they help our children. Um, so that's one thing I would say to you. Um, let's pay more attention to education, the kind of education that includes the invisible people, because if you don't know about the invisible people. You, you keep telling this. We, we tell a very narrow American story. We've been so happy with that story. Just, and meanwhile, all these other people are standing right here, all of them, especially in this part of the country, which was a you know, major seaport. Everybody was here. Asians were here, you know, Caribbean people, South America. We were all here, different religions were all here, but we like to tell a little narrow story. So you have to think what would happen if we all just started telling this story a bigger story and just expanded American history rather than contracted it. It would, it would, it would let, allow more people to find their place uh, and come together about what do we want to do next together as opposed to sticking, you know, defending some kind of narrow story that just in no kind of way stands up, just doesn't stand up. So that's what I would say. I would say uh, where we can, let's, let's start with the storytelling and the history, including our own document our own stories. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, let that one go for a minute. I, I would add too that, that I think some of the things that students don't often know is that social movements were incredibly diverse and people were doing so many, I mean we've shared all of these different things that people were doing. People were doing so many different things, they had so many different roles in social movements. It really, and we, so when we think about like the civil rights movement, for example, we think, oh, it was success. Or we think about the suffrage movement, right? Oh, it was successful. But the sort of complexity of how it was successful, right? We don't always get down to like the dirty, messy, 
you know, movement stuff, and it's that because we're in right now. We're inside of that mess, um, and it's and we look at it and we're like, oh my god, you know, like it's exhausting and it's not going to be helpful. It's not going to be successful. We're hopeless, and I think all of that is part of all of the movements that we look back on and call successful. <laughs> it really it takes. They're incredibly diverse. They're heterogeneous. They're like filled with a lot of different people doing different things, right? So. Things that we might we might look back on and say, well, that that was not that's not that does not make a good movement. Those are not good strategies. Except they are strategies that were part of a movement that we think about now as successful, right? So there's room. I mean, I think one of the things I say to students all the time is there is literally room for you to do anything in the movement because all of it happened in our past and all of it is going to get us to the, I mean, when I think about some of the folks who are, you know, like the women who are organizing NACW um, versus some of the poor working class women who are, who are organizing those proto-unions, they have vastly opposite ideas about strategies, tactics, and in sometimes goals. And yet, there they all are organizing at the same time for essentially racial justice, right? So when we look back at that time, we think about all the gains. The gains happened because all those different people were doing very different things at the same time. Um, and so remembering the he that there's diversity and heterogeneity and conflict and debate about that, that's what makes a successful movement. We need all of it, every bit of it. So there's room for everybody to do everything inside of a movement. I would also like to, to, to piggyback on that by saying that the, um, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs um, was um, officially formed in 1904. And it's actually uh, came about from the merger of the National Federation of African American Women, the Women's Era Club, and the Colored Women's League of DC. So these groups came together because they realized that they were more pro it was more productive for them to work together than to remain independent since, again, their, their objectives were similar. Mm -hmm. So they did join together in that. And uh, yes, uh, Josephine St. Pierre Ruffin was the person who um, uh, came up with, you know, came, suggested that they come together in that way. And I just want to also point out that the um, additional founders of that group, the National Association of Colored Women's Clubs, was Harriet Tubman, Frances Harper, um, and Ida B. Wells Barnett, and Mary Church Terrell, who was their first president. And um, once again, I just want to say that Mary McLeod, yeah. <laughs> Mary McLeod Bethune was their, their eighth president from 1924 to 1928. So yeah, come together. They had, they had similar objectives. I'll, I'll, say, I'll add this one thing. A woman uh, preservationist from New Bedford uh, was speaking at the African Meeting House, which all of you, I hope, are visiting at, at some point and supporting um, the African Meeting House in Boston. And she just said, I've, I'm not going to ask everybody to change, you know, 20% of what they do, because that's just ridiculous. Not going to happen. But if we all changed, say, 2%, if we added 2% to what we do, just cast down your bucket, you know, right there. What, what, are, you, what are you doing right now? Uh, and look at the two, and for the two percent of your time, how do I make this better? How do I make this more diverse, more inclusive? How do I bring voices forward that haven't been heard? How do I address young people or whoever, whatever it is you're doing? Mm -hmm. Add that two percent. If we all did the two percent, um, we, we'd be on our way. That's that's what these club women, that's what these club people did. Yeah. So that's that's another response to you. Uh, what your advice? Pay attention to history and figure out your 2% and spread the word. Okay, we have time for um, one more question. She had a question too. I wanted to ask if there were any journals or diaries because you wonder how people are feeling, if they were disenchanted, if they came up with an idea or something. And I cite that because to me, I was not raised with certain, you know, how would I say? history brought up to my attention, but one of the things that always sticks in my head is the diary Anne Frank that really brought out the, you know, the travesties of, um, and, and abuses that took place, you know, prior to the um, World War II and during World War II, and I was just curious if there were any diaries or journals out there. Harriet Jacobs, right. 
I mean, yes, <laughs> yes, uh, from different era eras. You know, um, I think a um, you, you. I'm believing in Google these days. You know, <laughs> diaries, black women. You know, history. Um, so yes, there are letters that have survived. There are uh, from you know between people and uh, certainly diaries. Uh, and then, you know, uh, after the Civil War, the federal government began, uh, you know, serious uh, projects to collect oral histories. So people who couldn't write were interviewed. Um, and, and true to form, because if you decide that these women are not important and they have nothing to say and they're sort of subpar, subhuman or something, those oral histories just disappeared into the, into the bureaucracy. Right, so it's scholars, it's younger scholars who come along now, and pull that stuff out. Stephanie, you know, uh, Jones Roberts. I have to change her name around, but just uh, they read. She said, "Wait a minute, um, what's in this diary?" She started reading these oral histories, which is what you're talking about in diaries. They're in the archives, the National Archives, and these are black women telling their stories. In this case, of being enslaved. Right, what it felt like what happened to them, et cetera, et cetera. And, she, and here's the other part. Not only did she read them, this is the most important part, she believed them, right? She believed them. She said, well, if this is true, then, you know, uh, white women own slaves. There was no white women, pure white women would never have slaves. Yes, white women own slaves. And how did she get there? Because of the oral histories. She believed the women. Uh, you know what I mean? So your question is, I think so great. How do I get back to some source material that helps me understand how people were feeling and what was going on? And so the answer is, uh, if you spend maybe with your two percent one day, you know, do a little. You'll, you'll find some wonderful. You find wonderful uh, stories, and they help us reimagine uh, not just that time, but they help us reimagine now when people aren't necessarily paying attention to somebody's. Same old story over here, but they're not listening. So thank you for asking them. And all of those are in the Library of Congress. They're, they're open access, and they, it's recordings and transcripts. And you also had the press. Um, a lot of folks were writing um, articles uh, to the press. For example, uh, Gertrude Bastille Mosell uh, wrote an article, uh, a pro-suffrage article, um, which was published in the New York Freeman. So you have access to, perhaps have access, uh, again, through Google or whatever, to some of those articles that were written on pro-suffrage. We, we have to say this about the press. Yes. We have to say you have to be a detective. You have to love detective stories, okay. right? Because sometimes you're listening to a reporter, a reporter from, uh, you know, 1872, who's busy with, with his own lens, you know, telling a story that, telling you somebody was, a, was you know, a freed slave when actually he was a freeman who did X, Y, Z, or telling you he was, a, he was a work for a company preparing food when actually he was a businessman or had a catering company. So, I mean, so you have to, I think, to uncover black history, to live it and have fun with it, you, ha you have to start back with, these are people just like us. Let's start there. <laughs> who had their own agency and activity. You had to start there, and then you might have to interpret some things, and, and be, these guys dig all the time. That's how they come up with this. They're, they're imagining those missing pieces and putting them back together, and that's what's, what's required of us. Otherwise, you show up quoting a reporter from 1772 telling you something that was just not true. So a white reporter, white male reporter, let's get it there. So, you know, have fun with it. So I missed a hand. Um, this will be our last question. Okay. Thanks for letting me ask this question. I know we're out of time. Um, so I was thinking, one of the panelists mentioned earlier about uh, the white suffragists, suffragists mm -hmm. not wanting to be associated with the suffragettes, which were more militant in Britain. And I was, I don't know if there's, I imagine that the women of color who were active and leading in the suffrage movement might have had different opinions on what were the best strategies. Um, and I was wondering, do we have a written record of that? And if we do, if you could speak to it at, or at all. Thanks. Uh, yes, yeah, so yes, and actually I was thinking about the Deltas actually because uh, Treva Lindsay did a really great book called Colored No More where she has a chapter 
um, that includes the the um, Alpha Suffrage Club and the Deltas and that march in particular in 1913 in DC where the black suffragists are, are asked to, to march at the back um, and and don't um, Mary Church Durrell and the Deltas and and the and uh, Wells um, so uh, but I want to, you know, like so in the early 20th century, there's uh, there's some literature that talks about the the kind of mobilization of respectability politics, specifically for Black women that are doing all kinds of activism. Right, the club women um, are, are kind of central to this, uh, and the the kind of performance, aesthetic, but also behavioral performance and comportment in particular ways to combat pervasive stereotypes about black women. And this is true for middle class and upper class white women who are doing suffrage work. Similarly, right, they are also combating per pervasive stereotypes about um, sort of mannish women who would be advocating for suffrage. But the difference is that white middle and upper class women who are um, uh, suffrage activists really can also mobilize their race and class privileges to do certain things in public spaces that black women um, who are organizing around all kinds of issues can't really do. Um, they don't have that kind of leverage and privilege that is race and class based to be able to do those kinds of things. So in many ways, you know, we can, the 19th Amendment, um, it, it, the kind of the spectacle that white women are able to to do for so much of their activism in that kind of late the de the last decade uh, before the Nineteenth Amendment is really about their ability to um, be out and about in a particular way because of race and class privilege. Well, thank you. I personally want to thank all three of you for agreeing to be on the panel. I, I've learned so much. This is not my background. So I, I, I'm walking away with more information um, than I did coming in this evening. And I pray that you all um, feel the same way. Um, I also want to thank the library and the um, program coordinator, Pat Monteith, for coordinating this and asking me to be a moderator for this. Um, being a product of an HBCU, Fisk University, located in Nashville, I, I do see the importance of our history um, because it is also American history. Um, I think that we can all agree that the fight did not end in 1920, and it did not end in 1965, and it, it has not ended in 2020. So <laughs> with that said, I want to use that as a transition to encourage you all to check out the um, information that the library has put together. There's also books on this. I know a few of you mentioned um, what are some of the books that you guys can read to learn more. They are located on the um, this side of the room. I encourage you and urge you to take a look, and they can also be checked out this evening um, from the library. Um, last but not least, I want to remind you all that there are um, surveys in the back of the room from Master Manus. Oh, perfect, she's handing them out. Um, please take the time to, um, to fill those out if you can. This concludes um, tonight's event. I pray that you all have a great night and a safe travel home. I just want to, um, while you're filling out the survey, um, to um, expound upon what one of the um, audience members mentioned earlier, that the Greater Boston section of the National Council of Negro Women is, in fact, uh, doing a census information and voter registration uh, forum this coming Saturday, so three days, um, at uh, the Bowling Municipal Building in Boston on Washington Street and Nubian Square formerly Dudley. Um, please come out if you um, are interested in learning more about the census and there will be an opportunity to register your young people to vote and um, oh 12 o'clock 12 to 3 um, two, two of our, in addition to the census uh, specialists that will be there in, in uh, speaking in different languages of course as, in addition to English um, there will be uh, Laurie Nelson from the um, city of Boston um, 
let's see, she's the chief resilience officer and will be uh, the mayor's spokesperson. And also Senator Markey, Senator Ed Markey will be there to help to um, get the message out and to encourage us. Um, bowling, B-O-L-L-I-N-G, municipal building. I have a, a couple of flyers and it's at, from 12 to 3. It's 2300 Washington Street in Roxbury. And you're all invited.